of the arbitration investigation practice group globally. Um, on December 21st, 2015, President Barack Obama appointed him to the panel of conservators of the World Bank's International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. He has represented eight countries as lead counsel and served as an arbitrator and counsel in major ICC and ICSID proceedings. Pedro uh, Martinez Prada serves on the advisory council on the restatement uh, of international commercial arbitration for the American Law Institute. He has written more than 50 articles published in 15 countries and published five languages and five books on public and private international law, some of um, which you, you worry about. Two of his books have been translated into Mandarin by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences of the People's Republic of China. He's currently adjunct professor at the NYU Law School. He also serves as a full visiting professor at the University of Navarra School of Law in Spain, uh, and as an honorary professor of law uh, in um, Peru. He served as an adjunct professor at the University of Miami School of Law from 2002 to 2010. He's been a member of the American Law Institute since 1999. Uh, he's a graduate of St. Uh, John's College and Columbia Law School. Um, he holds Magister and PhD degrees from uh, Madrid. And uh, Praga is admitted to the practice of law in Florida District of Columbia and Spain. So um, please enjoy the next three days, every second of the seminar. And one more time, welcome with me, Pedro Martinez Prado. Thank you so much. Only 2,060 are in effect. By the way, 
your country, the Republic of Turkey, has 145 of those treaties, all of which I look with delicious detail. Of those 145, 45 are not in effect. So you have 100. But hopefully, what you hear and learn during the course of these three days will help you think about whether there is even an interest in changing some of those treaties, rethinking some of those treaties, or elaborating on some of those treaties. I want to share, first of all, a story with you that is a thought experiment, which is what our talk here is today. In the year 500 of the old era, what we say in the United States BC, in the year 500 of the old era, Anaxagoras, the Greek mathematician, was incarcerated. He was incarcerated because he asserted two propositions. The first proposition was that the sun was inanimate, that the sun was not alive, that it had no soul. The second proposition was that the moon did not reflect its own light, that it was a parasitic light that really came from the sun. Both of those propositions were not acceptable. They were not acceptable socially, politically, or academically. When he was in prison, can we turn the, the, the power put out, please? No. I think they got the message that was starting to say. When he was in prison, he set forth a mathematical problem, a mathematical challenge that's very, very interesting. This is the problem, and I want you to try to understand what I'm trying to say with the problem. The problem is very simple. He said for any given circle to construct a square, I'm sorry, this is a square, I don't know. To construct a square that is equal to the area of a circle. But it has two qualifications. You need to use a ruler. You know what a ruler is? A straight edge ruler? And you have to use a compass. Those are the two qualifications. This was, I have to repeat myself, this was in the year 500 BC. That problem, I don't want to mislead you, did not lay dormant. The problem became an obsessive issue for 21 centuries. And in fact, in the 19th century, the 1800s, the problem was so popular, understand, they didn't have TV back then. The problem was so popular that countries gave large prizes to anyone who would solve the problem. Let me share with you that the problem was not solved until 1882. But there's something very interesting. Along the way, between 500 and 1882, there seemed to be progress. And usually in science, in mathematics in particular, but certainly in law too, where there is progress, it's good. But in this case, progress was no good. It was very bad. Because the progress, mostly having to do with theories on semicircles, were approximations that only created false hope. And false hope for our species of human beings is a very, very bad thing. Because it means that we will persist and persist and keep going. So this time was fueled by a lot of false hope. And that's very important to our discussion in a little bit. Because I'm going to submit to you that in what we are doing, there's a lot of false hope. Let me also share another piece of information that I think you'll find very relevant, even though I'm not, at, at first it may not seem that way. Part of that false hope 
is contradictory. Because at a fundamental level, at a very fundamental level, people knew that there was something very wrong with this picture. The reason they, they knew that something was very wrong with the, the picture is because under the mathematics that they were using, they were using simple, you know, and then later the algebra we know and Euclidean geometry, right? Under the mathematics that they were using, <laughs> thank you so much. One side of that square would have to be equal to the radius of the circle that they've selected times the square root of pi. What that means is that one side of that square didn't make any sense and could not make any sense. This is critical. Because even though they knew that it made no sense and could not mathematically make any sense, people still persisted. And the question that you have to ask is, well then, what happened in 1882? In 1882, two mathematicians said something very interesting. They said, pi cannot be a polynomial of an with an irrational coefficient. Stated differently with a rational coefficient, I'm sorry, with a rational coefficient. Stated differently, pi can never be an algebraic number with an irrational. Can never be an irrational algebraic number. Can't happen. And they squared the circle following the rules. But they squared the circle, ladies and gentlemen, by changing all the rules. All the rules were changed. So that a right triangle under the new geometry that made it possible to square the circle, when the sum of the angles of the right triangle did not equal 180 degrees. A circle did not have 360 degrees. A perpendicular, a right angle, did not equal 90 degrees. Parallel lines touched. Non-parallel lines did not touch. You understand? There was a complete shift in paradigm. And, of course, you're saying, what does this shift in paradigm have to do with what we're doing here today? Let me share this with you, everything. Because the law, public international law today, has to address a shift in paradigm from a model of independence to a model of interdependence. Let me share with you two principles that I know you know very well. And the first principle you've heard of your entire academic life, and that is, that every state investor, every investor who invests in a state that is not her or his national state, it's not his or her place of nationality, every entity person that does this has a nearly sacrosanct right. That person has the right to have his or her investment protected. Do we agree on that principle? It's an important principle, isn't it? But together with that principle, there is a second principle that I'd like to share with you, which is just as important, which is the principle that a state has an obligation to engage in what we call regulatory sovereignty. Do you agree with me that a state has a right to engage in regulatory sovereignty, in issuing laws, in issuing administrative regulations, in exercising judicial and executive decrees? But often, these two principles collide. And very, very often, these two principles cause the regulatory, the regulatory act sometimes causes the investment to depreciate or the investment is harmed or the investment is devalued 
or the investment is altogether eviscerated in a direct or an indirect expropriation or in conduct tantamount to a direct or indirect expropriation. And when you have these two principles, ladies and gentlemen, as they do all the time, in conflict, how do you resolve it? How do you square the circle? What are the principles that we use to address this issue? What happens when we have to address this issue in the extreme case but common case of an indirect regulatory expropriation? Does not the state have every right to tax, to issue permits, to regulate? In fact, the state that cut on that obligation is putting at risk, if taken to its ultimate extreme, its own existence. The exercise of regulatory sovereignty, we know, is existential, and nothing short of an existential right. Now, when a state expropriates, how does that work? How is it? How, what happens under international law? How does this play out under, how does international law govern the friction between the investor and the state? Well, I'll tell you how I think it governs. Poorly. Very poorly. I think that if you have algorithms given the current status of the interpretation, formation, and transformation of the foundational principles of public international law, you can almost arithmetically predict what's going to happen in the different cases. That's the level of uncertainty that I see, and we're going to talk a lot about this in the next two classes. Today, we're going to take that uncertainty, and we're going to embody that uncertainty, if you will, in the public purpose doctrine. When the state expropriates, there are four elements, as you know, that govern the expropriation. Does anyone care to share the words? Don't be shy. Come. This is the class. Okay, I'll tell you the four elements. The first element is the state can expropriate, of course. That's, where, that's not the first element. That's, that's the proposition. The state can expropriate, but to do so, the state, in order to have a legal expropriation, the state must satisfy four requirements that are fundamental, they're very routine. Even though I'll show you how, in some documents, it's not that routine. And the question will become, well, why, why, is it, why is there a deficit? Why is the law not what you're telling me it's supposed to be? The first point is the expropriation must not be discriminatory. And this you should have like you know your name. The second point is that the discrimination, the, the, the expropriation, I'm sorry, has to comport with due process. It has to comport with due process. The third point is that there must be compensation. And the fourth point, of course, is what? Public purpose. The expropriation must be for a public purpose. Every expropriation, if it is to be legal, will have to meet this requirement. The question becomes, what is public purpose? Let me start by saying what public purpose perhaps is not. Public purpose is not public policy. Public policy or public order 
is typically the opposite of public purpose. Public order is what, or public policy is what the state says you cannot do. The state says you can't, for example, enter into a contract if the subject matter of that contract is illegal. If the subject matter of that contract, for example, is a contract to, uh, to break tax laws or to do harm to another person, this is illegal. It's against public policy. So public purpose, on the other hand, is what can the state actually do? And obviously this is, this is very critical. But in trying to articulate what the state can actually do, the definition that we have of public purpose is completely unavailable. It's no good because we have no definition of public purpose. It's not defined anywhere. The public purpose that we have that is defined the definition we have of public purpose is a very, very basic definition. It's the definition that public purpose is subjective, subjective. It is whatever the state says is public purpose. And if that's the case, then the question becomes, well, what point then is there in talking about public purpose? You're wasting my time. If it's subjective, if it's what the state wants it to be, what meaning can that have? We already have a meaning. It's subjective. Well, there are two immediate consequential reasons that have more than just theoretical appeal for public purpose, for having a definition that is not a subjective definition. And here we have to stop and we have to think a little bit. First, if public purpose is violated in an expropriation, if the subject matter of the expropriation is not for a public purpose, so that the myth mythical state takes over the property and gives the property to a private sector competitor of an influential member of the government. I think all of us here will agree that cannot be for a public purpose. It's the state unfairly helping a private sector person without any justification in doing so. If you have that situation, international law says, well, Fine. When the claimant files a claim under a treaty that has expropriation as a standard of protection, and that standard of protection is being asserted, international law says, claimant, you can get compensation, one of the elements of expropriation, beyond just fair compensation, beyond just adequate compensation beyond just prompt, adequate, and effective compensation. And in fact, there is some authority that says the claimant, not only can you get compensation, but you can get some really, really good compensation. I want to read from a case that I think is interesting. This is the Chorzo uh, factory case, the uh, ICJ case. And this is one of the few places where there's a suggestion that if you violate one of these principles in the expropriation, the practical immediate consequential effect is what? You're going to have to pay more when compensation time comes around. And uh, here's, I'm just going to read a, 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 little, a little snippet. Uh, again, for those of you who are, who are interested, this is the permanent court of, of international justice, the precursor to the ICJ, of course. And this is Germany versus Poland, uh, Poland loses. It says, it follows that the compensation due to the German government 
is not necessarily limited to the value of the, of the undertaking at the moment of disposition, of this, this possession, sorry, plus interest to the day of payment. This limitation would only be admissible if the Polish government had the right to expropriate. Let's stop there. Did you hear what I just said? Only if the Polish government had the right to expropriate, i.e., if all four elements are met, can they then have fair payment? And if it's wrongful act consisted merely in not having paid to the two companies the just price of what was expropriated. In the present case, such a limitation result, might result in placing Germany in the interest protected from the Geneva Convention, on behalf of which interests the German government is acting, in a situation more unfavorable than that in which Germany and these interests would have been in if Poland had respected the said convention. Such consequences would not only be unjust, but also, above all, incompatible with the aim of Article 6 and following articles of the Convention. That is to say, the prohibition in principle of the liquidation of the property rights and interests of German nationals and of companies controlled by German nationals in Upper Silesia, since it would be tantamount to rendering lawful liquidation and unlawful disposition indistinguishable as far as their financial results are concerned. So there is authority for the proposition that, obviously, it does matter. And this is absolutely critical to what we're doing. And 
try to set some uh, standards in defining uh, some uh, legal institutions and uh, concepts. Yeah. I hope I'm wrong again. That's, that's, that's very helpful. Anyone else? Any, any other thoughts about the AI? You, sir? Uh, I think they uh, published the restatements uh, on American law.
coming to be taken for public purpose. The requirement that a taking be for a public purpose is, reiter is reiterated in most formulations of the rules of international law on expropriation of foreign property. That limitation, however, has not figured prominently in international claims practice, perhaps because the concept of public purpose is broad and not subject to effective re-examination by other states. Presumably, a seizure by a dictator or oligarchy for private use could be challenged under this rule. Let me go back. The restatement uses the word broad. It's too vague. And the restatement says it cannot be challenged by another state. And in our context of investor state arbitration, we know what we're talking about. We're talking about a signatory, uh, a citizen of a signatory state in a treaty, right? So the UK, Italy, uh, and, uh, and Turkey, or, or the UK and France, or let's say let's take it more in the north of uh, Then you have a situation where if Argentina does not meet the public purpose requirement, the thinking here is that it cannot be challenged. Now, let's stop for a second and think. A lot of people, including smart people, believe that if public purpose stays without a definition, if it stays in its current state of subjectivity, that's good for host states. That's good for capital exporting states, uh, uh, importing states, uh, capital importing states. Let me just clarify what I mean by both states and capital importing and capital exporting states. As you know, the United Nations recognizes 192 countries. So we agree with that, right? With the exception of Kosovo and Taiwan and the Vatican. And this is not a political theory class, so I'm not talking about what I think about that. Of those 192 nations, after you leave the first I'll be generous, 25. The rest of the states are relatively poor by any measure. We have numbers that tell us that a child dies every 15 seconds from malnutrition, every 27 seconds from a curable disease. That's the rest of the world that we leave the first 25. By the way, there are problems with the first 25 too, but I want to be dramatic. So when I'm talking about a capital importing state, I'm talking about the states that most of the world, which says, I want to attract foreign direct investment. Those are the capital importing states. And those are the states that I call old states. By the way, have, have any of you read a lot of economics or some economics? Yes? Yes, you have. Do you find, I want to have a little conversation with you. Do you find, I'm not just having a conversation, I'm having a conversation. Do you find that economists disagree a lot? Economists uh, listen. Could you repeat that? Do you find that economists yes. disagree amongst themselves a lot? They do all the time. Yes. Yeah. They, they can't agree on, on anything. They can't agree on, on their social, but they can't agree on their telephone. I mean, they, they can't agree on anything, Thomas. But I'll share something with you. They agree on one thing. They agree on the principle that the fastest and most effective way, how are you? The fastest and most effective way to develop economically if you're an economy in transition or a developing country is to FDI, foreign direct investment. So that if you are a capital importing state, it's important to be able to defend yourself when there's an, an investment and that investor says, you know what? 
capital, uh, capital importing state, post state, we robbed you. You took that property. You illegally taxed me. You denied me licenses, permit. And now my business is running at 30%, or 10%, or I don't have a business here, it's appropriated. And the question becomes, if we have, ladies and gentlemen, please, if we have a subjective public purpose document, people say that's good for the developing country. Because it means that if the developing country is sued in a public international law, investor state arbitration, the developing country, always, the host state always has the defense of public purpose. So that's good. If you give public purpose meaning, that's bad for the whole state. That's an argument that I hear all the time. I also hear from my side of it. That's not my side of the argument, but I hear that argument a lot. And what do you think about that argument, ladies and gentlemen? What do you think about the argument that says, if you give public purpose teeth, and you turn public purpose, they say public purpose today is a test that is always met. No matter what the state does, it meets the public purpose requirement. I say if you have a test that's always met, that's meaningless. It's just words on paper. It will always be met. You might as well take it out. So we're at a fork in the road. And then I say, no, I'm not proclaiming. I'm not pro anything. I defend both sides, states and claims. If you have a public purpose that is subjective, I share with you that I think it hurts the state. It hurts the state. It hurts the state trying to advantage itself through the subjective public purpose. And you're asking me, why is that? And how can that be? And the answer is simple. What does it mean for a state to premise an action that's being characterized as a violation of treaty law on a foundational doctrine that is hollow, that it's meaningless, that has been politicized? The, the, the state uses total normativity in what it did. Total normativity. The, straight, the state is much stronger if it says, let me tell you what the elements of public purpose are. The international community has subscribed to them. And we've got all of them. What are you talking about? As an investor, you assume they risk. They do not. You knew what the risks were. You knew what our economy was about. You knew what our regulatory rubric was. You did due diligence before you came in here. P.S. That means postscript, sorry. In addition, most states have something that we'll talk about today that I call FIPS, F-I-P-S, which is Foreign Investment Protection Statute. And the state can say, you read our statute. You read our Foreign Investment Protection Statute, and therein you saw exactly what we consider to be important to us as a country. That situation I share with you, ladies and gentlemen, is much more productive, beneficial for the state and for all the stakeholders. What also happens inevitably and decisively and necessarily if you have a vacuum in public purpose? Well, lack of legitimacy. The whole thing is wrong. It's crooked. It stinks. There's no transparency. There's no predictive value. There's no certainty. Every rudimentary pillar is challenged in a horrible way. Now, there's an author who wrote a, a very interesting book. I, I know that I'm, in the United States, we would say butchering his name. Uh, but uh, his name is Nico Schreiber. You know, you know Nico Schreiber? You know him? His name is Nico Schreiber. He wrote a wonderful book on a concept that we're going to talk a little bit about. 
which is called, the concept is called permanent sovereignty over natural resources. Uh, the book is called something very, very close to that. Uh, the, the book is called Sovereignty Over Natural Resources, Balancing Rights and Duties. It's, it's a 1997 book, and on pages 291 and 292, I want to share with you what this very thoughtful person had to say about the public purpose doctrine. Now, you remember what the restatement said. It says, you know, basically it's out there, it's everywhere, but it really doesn't matter. And it's, it's inconsequential because it cannot be re-examined, it cannot be challenged. It's self-judging. One state, meaning in our field, one claim cannot go after it. It says, the most relevant decisions, the view, in the most relevant decisions, the view has been taken that lawful nationalization or expropriation must serve a purpose. And there's a lot of citations, the usual citations. But sometimes with qualifications. For example, in the, the Amco case, it was held, and he quotes, as to the contention that the said measures were politically motivated, they're talking about expropriation, that were politically motivated and not pursuant and not in pursuance of a legitimate public purpose. It is the general opinion in international theory that public utility is not a necessary requirement for the legality of a nationalization. Did you hear that? It says it's not a requirement. It's there, but it's not a requirement. It doesn't because it doesn't mean anything. And it goes on to say, this is a quote. Right? While many conclude that the demand of a public interest or public purpose should be maintained, there is recognition of the fact that ultimately it is the taking government which determines the public purpose or utility of a particular expropriation. And that in many cases, it can be taken as impossible that an international court or organization can form a reasonable judgment on the accuracy of a claim by a state that an action served a public purpose, citations of it, and I continue. In summary, a state is not completely free to determine the justification and conditions for nationalization, but it is bound by certain international law requirements. In practice, however, it has wide margins of discretion. I will tell you, if that is disheartening, I don't know what is. But I'll give you another example that I think is even more frustrating. Maybe some of you have, have studied it. I don't know, do, do any of you recall the, uh, the Anglo-Iranian case before the International Court of Justice? Big, important case. Very, very important case. It was the UK against Iran. And the UK claimed that Iran had expropriated its investors. Now, I've looked very, very closely at that case. I've written to get the transcripts from the case. The case, the claimant, the party that says I was expropriated, in that case, never raised the public purpose doctrine. The UK lawyers argued every conceivable theory, but they didn't even waste a drop of ink on public purpose. And if you look at the record, there's no mention of public purpose. Now, I don't, I don't want to take this issue. What happened in that case was that, and, and I'm glad it happened. I don't want to make decisions, but I'm glad it happened this way. The UK complaint was dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. So we would never, we will never have the benefit of knowing how public purpose would have developed in that case. But I will tell you one thing, the very fact that it was nowhere in the transcript and nowhere in the record 
is absolutely nothing short of extremely, extremely problematic. I want to uh, I want to contextualize what we're doing a little bit with four principles that I think are important before I start talking a little bit about the uh, Four or 
five years. Yes? Would you like to explain the Purushan principle briefly? How would you apply the Purushan? Of course. Well, very simply. In looking at a measure, we would see whether the measure is the least intrusive measure, the most intrusive measure, whether the measure has any rational economic relationship to the good that it's supposed to take, how it measures quantify, from a quantification standpoint with the investor itself. Oh, excuse me. I don't know, does that help? That's what I mean by the proportionality principle. In the context of public purpose, there is no proportionality in its current status. It's all enough. It's all enough. Do we know how much time I have? Um, we have like 40, 45 minutes. 40, 45 minutes. Uh, let me give you one more principle. We'll take a 15 minute break. As, as we today, just so that you understand, uh, the public purpose doctrine is completely divorced from all the things that I've said. All the things that I've said don't apply to But I'll make you even happier today. They apply, they apply only haphazardly, and if at all, and certainly in no systematic way, to any to any of the investment protection standards contained in the bids or the multilateral investments. Here's the second proposition that I wanted to share with you. There, it is completely, completely um, forgotten that a legitimate expropriation is very different from an, an illegitimate expropriation. But more importantly, this is the principle that I want you to take away. It is, there is absolutely no evidence in public international law that supports the proposition that a single state, a state can unilaterally set forth the grounds for expropriation. Now, having said that, we're going to take a break for 15 minutes. Thank you. And then we'll continue. I did that list 
a very important one that I think also in the field of public international law, of investment law, has caused an influence that favors, that favors capital exporting states, that favors the elite states that invest in developing countries and economies in transition. And that is that while we've been talking about bilateral investment treaties here and public purpose being an element of expropriation and expropriation being an element or a standard of protection in a bilateral investment treaty, I've done a very poor job in explaining what is a bilateral investment treaty and the legacy, the legacy non-symmetrical, the legacy non-symmetrical negotiations that have affected bilateral investment treaties. Does anyone care to tell us what a bilateral investment treaty is? And basically how a bilateral investment treaty works? Please, sir, what's your name? My name is
And this is, it says that the parties enter, and the parties agree that they will, that, that, that they will extend the parties of the other signatory state, citizens and the nationals of the other signatory states, a whole series of protections. And those protections are many. That one is called the uh, you know, National Treatment Standard, uh, you know, pursuant to which the state says, I will, each state says, I will not treat a non-national any less favorably than I treat a national. Uh, there, there will be uh, a, a, uh, a very important standard of protection sometimes called fair and equitable treatment, for example. You will have it. There will be a standard of protection that will be uh, expropriation. And there, there, there's something called an umbrella clause that says that, there, that there, there's any, uh, that both states will honor any collateral agreements that they have with investors from the other state. So there are all these protections. But I'm going to show you something about this bilateral investment treaty, which is like all bilateral investment treaties. If you divide the bilateral investment treaty, and you look at the bilateral investment, so oh, let me just give you one more, one more information before I go here. I'm sorry. So what happens is these two countries stay in power when they sign this bilateral investment treaty. And as it happens, some Spanish company invested in Paraguay. And when this Spanish company invested here, it's a cement company. The cement company invested in Paraguay. The cement company started giving off fumes because the cement company did not install the appropriate filters. And these fumes over a radius of 85 miles, I don't know, 150 kilometers, I don't know. This, these fumes went into the atmosphere and caused rain, 100, 150 kilometers, the circumference here, because they were using the wrong filters. And because they were using the wrong filters, they were also violating the laws of Paraguay that required the right filter. And the state says, you have to modernize or we have to close down the cement factory. And the cement factory, the Spanish investors of the cement factory, say, if we buy the new filters, which cost $75 million, even if I finance it over 25 years, which is the life guarantee of the filters, I did not make money. So now by forcing me, by forcing me to buy the thing, you have in effect taken my profit, sir. You've taken my business. You're in violation. You've hurt my business. This is the equivalent of an expropriation. My business has been devalued. This, this violates for an equitable treatment. I see that you don't enforce that law with respect to my competitors who are national in Paraguay. So if you're not treating me the same way you treat your nationals, this is selective enforcement. So once that happens, the Spaniard says, gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? The Spanish company says, what am I going to do? And they come see you. And the Spanish investor says, the last thing I want to do is file a claim in a Paraguayan court. I, I don't want to appeal to the courts of the country that took my cement plant. What do I do? Anybody? The lawyer, you say, wait a minute. You don't have to go to the Paraguayan courts. I've got the solution for you. I went to the seminar. <laughs> There's a treaty between Spain and Paraguay. And what they did to your plant, to your plant you say to the guy, or the gal, is wrong. It's a violation of the protection standards. It's wrong. We can 
file a claim, depending on what this treaty says, either pursuant to the United Nations rules, the Unsel Trump rules, or the rules of the World, of the world Bank, the IMSIT rules, the rules of the International Center for Settlement of Festival Disputes arising from the 1965 Washington Convention. We can file a claim, it'll be an arbitration claim, and we allege that the treaty was breached in these different ways. And that arbitration, the law that applies to arbitration will not be the law of Paraguay, it won't be the law of Spain, but it'll be a neutral law called public international law. And the arbitrators will not be from Paraguay, they won't be from Spain either, but they will be from either of the two countries, and there'll be three of them. And the matter, if it's an exit arbitration, the matter can be aired, processed, in one of three, or, or a combination or more of three of the principal languages, French, English, Spanish. The Spaniard looks at you and says, my God, you're amazing. It's a, this is incredible. He said, no, 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 just sign my engagement letter. <laughs> just, sign, just sign the engagement letter. Let's stop there for a second. I want you to see what's happening. The story sounds nice. I've done it so that it sounds really nice. But the story may not be that nice. Here's why. Once, and, and you go forward and you file your complaint. And let's make, let's say that it's with the International Center of uh, International Center for Something of the Western Disputes, which makes it the world out. Once you file that complaint, and now you're just looking at this from the outside, once you file a complaint, Here's, here's what we'll do. Do I have a Not with us. Okay, here's, here's what you'll notice. You'll notice that Paraguay, the poorer of the two states, the capital importing state,
the treaty provides the host state with or respondent with very, very little obligations in comparison. Now you're saying, yeah, but that's also not helpful to me, Professor, because this treaty was negotiated. Right? You say it was negotiated. No one put a gun next to anyone's head to sign the treaty. You say that. And I say, you're right. No one put a gun next to anyone's head to sign the treaty. seen the relative economies of Paraguay and Spain? Have you seen the caloric intake in one country and the next? Infant mortality in one country and the next? Literacy in one country and the next? Economic development generally, the development even of agriculture in one country and the next? When these two countries signed this thing, Yes. Um, Spain was obviously Spain is the more economically and etc. But uh, not the weaker part here. So it was uh, pretty much take it or leave it contracts, so to say. And Paraguay uh, had no choice but to. I mean, they didn't actually negotiate. I didn't miss the lesson here. But. Uh, oh, you read the whole thing, so it doesn't matter. You're saying. Since Spain is more uh, actually. Uh, since Spain is more developed, uh, and, it, and it makes Spain the uh, stronger party, so uh, there were standard terms, I guess. So, the, I mean, they didn't negotiate, but practically it was a take it or leave contract, and Paraguay uh, didn't have much say in it, I'm guessing. So, maybe that could be the case, I mean, that could be the root of the problem. I am going again, by the way. I don't either. <laughs> Anyone else? Thoughts? I think this is very, like what she said, I think it's extremely helpful. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> try to my no, no, don't do it. You'll lose it. Yeah, I've spoken with two seasonal so. I practiced before coming here somewhere. <laughs> I think this is not as unfair as it seems. Because, like, uh, when Spain offers to its investors at better markets, Better access to so I'm in China. Yeah, better access to not in China. Okay, I will not try to be my Jackson for a second. Uh, Spain is a bigger market. Uh, they have more buying power, access to financials. On the other hand, Paraguay uh, have to offer better legal protection uh, to other investors to its country. Uh, so I don't think this is coincidence that uh, this is like this. Uh, so. This is somehow uh, balanced. You're saying it's balanced. Balanced. Uh, balanced. I think they're equal. You're saying they're equal. I'm not saying they're equal, but she's, she's saying they're not equal. She's saying, this is what she's saying. She's saying one country's clearly richer. Tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth. One country's clearly richer than the other. This country is in need of capital, in need of what we said, foreign direct investment. This country's going to do anything possible to get that money in there, anything possible to attract investors. The only thing this country is saying is follow the law. Follow the law. But you're saying, no, it doesn't matter if this is the, maybe the 10th most industrialized country of the 192, and this is probably number, you know, 75. You're saying that doesn't matter. That doesn't really matter. I don't think it matters. And also, I remember, like, uh, most of the foreign investment goes to developed countries, not to poor countries. So they have to attract more foreign investments. So what they do is uh, they provide more and better legal so, so you think that you think that Paraguay had had negotiating power, even though even though let's assume that the Spanish investor said, if, if I don't go there, the Spanish investor tells the Paraguayan government, the Spanish investor says, my wife likes the beaches in Uruguay, your neighbor, a lot. <coughs> so if if you don't help me here. We're going to invest, we're going to bring this $125 million cement company to Uruguay. So why don't you sign the treaty the way it is? It's a standard treaty. It has a standard clause that's in it. 
why for a dispute resolution mechanism? So if you have a dispute, you can arbitrate it and it basic protections. What else do you want? Paraguay. Do you want me to go to Uruguay? What do you want? That's what the Spaniards are saying. But you think that's that doesn't really reflect in the bilateral investment. I agree that one party is stronger, like economically, and by means of negotiating power. However, this is how it is meant to be. Otherwise, as you said, that the investment would go to another country. Let me give you. Does anyone else have thoughts on this issue? Does anyone think that that the bilateral investment trade really the countries have some sort of parity and they they have. They knew what the bilateral investment treaty was. They knew that once there was a violation, of course, the host state would have to would have the obligation of, of, of defending itself and of showing that it did comply with these these uh, these rights, these obligations to protect. Even though the burden technically is on the claim, but you know, burdens really. How many cases are decided? In any I don't have to do anything. 
It just has to be for a public purpose. Of course, I define what a public purpose is. I mean, in 2015, we write a book on public purpose, and we say no one knows what it is, it's what the state says it is, it has no meaning, everyone says it has no meaning, it must have a meaning. So in 1959, when West Germany and Pakistan signed this treaty, Pakistan knew that it had that if it expropriated, it had no, it had absolutely no defense. It knew that it had absolutely no defense. That the claimant in Germany, the citizen of West Germany were the claimant, they would be able to almost wait on any type of expropriation. So that goes a little bit against what I'm saying, in some sense. The treaty just has public purpose, and the treaty just has compensation. You see that? It's, it's a treaty that actually provides the most state with strong defense. The whole state need not comply. And yet the whole state in this case was the weaker of the two parties. By far. In this example that I'm showing you, Pakistan is Paraguay and West Germany is Spain. So of course, of course, we do find exceptions. And this museum piece is one of those exceptions. But that type of exception usually doesn't apply. Now there's another argument that I, I want to raise with you, which is a very, very simple one. There is a state of thought, there's an opinion in some circles, and I think you need to know this argument. I don't believe in it, but I think you need to know it. That says that, look, the distinction between capital exporting states and capital importing states, you know, the states that have citizens who invest in developing economies and, and, and economies in transition, that that distinction really doesn't exist. And they cite two examples and say, China is both a capital importing, capital exporting state. Brazil, also a capital importing, exporting state. Colombia, another capital importing, exporting state. India, another capital importing, exporting state. That's an interesting argument, but I don't believe in it. I don't believe in it because when you look at the numbers of the, these relationships in the bilateral investment treaties, almost always, of course not always, but almost always, there is a stronger party. Now, any thoughts on these treaties? Are they fair, unfair, are they helpful, not helpful? Should they protect the whole state, the, the country most likely to be sued by the investor? Should they have more protections for the whole state? Are we disadvantaging, yes, you say yes, what kind of, or, 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 or that kind of Yeah, no, no. I was saying that. Yeah? Uh, what do you think? If you feel that the whole state needs more protection, if you feel that, I personally feel that. And we're going to look at an example either tomorrow or the next day of how I think there's something called overprotection and how you can adjust for this way, for, for this measure. And by adjusting for overprotection, you actually are helping the whole state without really changing anything dramatically in the system. 
But thoughts, how can you help the whole state, given what we're seeing? What's one way? Any thoughts? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me give you the, the thing. I can break my voice. Okay. Uh, when you said that the Paraguay is the least common country, uh, in, in this case, yeah. Yeah, in this case, Paraguay is the least common country against the Spain's complaint. So uh, you said that all the obligations must apply by Paraguay. So it's actually creating a sense of injustice between those countries against the king. Yeah, that's, that's very powerful. <laughs> but look, look at it this other way. Let's be fair. It's no real sense of injustice. The parties knew that what they were doing was entering a bilateral investment treaty. They knew that if a claim were brought against them under the dispute resolution clause of the treaty, that they would have to defend against that claim by saying, no, none of those standards in the treaty were breached, A, and B, of course you knew that at that point, you knew at that point that the respondent state at that point has all the, has all the obligations. Tomorrow we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, and uh, thank you very much for your gracious and, and patience. Thank you.